This episode is brought to you by Sidekick Accounting. If you have a business, you're going to want to listen up. One of the biggest issues I come across with people in business is that we feel like our accountant doesn't understand us, doesn't understand us, doesn't understand our business model, our culture, and if you're in tech, then a lot of the services that we sell. That's a huge problem considering your accountant is advising you on how to best run your finances. They need to understand you and your business. For many of us, we usually start with someone who was introduced by family or friends, but don't realize that they're not equipped to help us scale. Another problem I hear often is that people just don't have a relationship with their accountant. They speak to them once or twice a year when tax is due or through one email per month asking them to fill in their VAT. This person is essentially running the financial side of your business. You should have a strong relationship with them. And that's where Sidekick Accounting comes in. So first of all, I want to reassure you guys, while this is a sponsored post, as you know, I always want to make sure what we present to you is something that we know. And so I've had a couple of meetings now with Ray Hahn, who is the founder of Sidekick, who I'm going to tell you a bit more about in a second, to make sure that he understands the freshly guided audience. So let's talk about Ray Hahn and Sidekick. Here's what you need to know. Sidekick are available and accessible all year round and are very responsive. While they can support all businesses, they specialize in digital and tech savvy companies. Rehan's team is so good that for some clients, they are the complete end-to-end -end outsourced finance team, handling everything from payments to strategy and of course, taxes. Did you know that 95% of businesses are missing tax opportunities because their accountants don't understand their business goals? Rehan's team has saved an average of 25% for their clients. They don't just simply file your end of year returns and see you next time. You can actually finally have a strong relationship with your accountants. And because I know how important it is to build relationships with people personally, especially somebody who's dealing with your money, I said to Rehan, I want to make sure that Freshly Grounded Tribe is looked after. So I want you to personally speak to anyone who comes through Freshly Grounded. And he agreed. So if you're looking for an accountant who will build with you, head over to sidekickaccounting.co.uk forward slash freshly grounded. That's sidekick, S I D E K I C K, accounting, A C C O U N T I N G dot co dot UK forward slash freshly grounded. Fill out the form and we'll make sure that Rehan personally gets in touch with you. Assalamu alaikum guys, welcome to Freshly Grounded. In this episode, me and Faisal will talk about our work with wasia.com, which is a company that's launching for the UK market. They are selling properties in the UAE with zero interest. All, all interest clauses have been taken out from the sales contracts, including late payment fees, and the contracts have been vetted by um, students of knowledge, um, such as the students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Arnaut, uh, to name but a few. So check it out. We hope if you find it interesting. We're definitely very excited about this. It's a revolutionary way for Muslims to enter the property market in the UAE with low barrier of entry, inshallah, no interest. Before you go, me and Faisal are going to be in London on June the 17th. That's a Saturday. Uh, we are presenting Wasia, the benefits of it, the dangers of riba. obviously will be discussed at the event as well. Come down, join us. The link is wasia.com forward slash London. It's a free event. Come along, learn about property in the UAE and how you can get involved. Uh, salam, bro. Wa alaikum salam, how you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. It's not often I say salam. It's better to say as alaikum, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah. Is it though? I'm not a scholar, but yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure it is, but, but is it? Is what I'm saying. Like, like, we don't know, do we? I mean, I don't know. But I'm yeah, sure I've, I've, heard, I've heard students of knowledge and stuff talk about it. Oh, and it's like, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense that it would be. Yeah. But yeah. also, like, you know, like, um, greet your brother with salam. Or greet your brother with salam. Yeah, good point. I don't, yeah, I think it's still a good to thing to say, inshallah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. We should find that out. Yeah. Let's ask. If anyone in the comments knows any details about this, let us know. But yeah, salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. No, it is because you're right. Because it's like you should greet with someone with something better. So it's assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi, assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi, wa barakatuh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, well, you know when um, you do taslim in the salah, mm. I remember the first time I went to a mosque and uh, they did the taslim where you just do one taslim. Okay. Which is valid. Yeah. And I also remember going to one, that was in Morocco. I remember going, one time going to one where it was like, assalamu alaikum, Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh on one on yeah. one and a short on the left side and a short and then like assalamu alaikum yeah. something like that I've never been to a masjid where, where the imam did that though yeah I, in Morocco they, I went to a mosque and he just did assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and that was it so I was done in Morocco do they 
do um, is it called saddle with their hands by their sides when they're praying? Like the uh, well, the Maliki, um, yeah. no, they do that here though. I, hear, I see some some brothers doing it here. Yeah, that's that's quite common here. Yeah, and but they they there they recite. What's different there is that they were recite, reciting Warsh. So what's the most common type of recitation that we know of is Hafsan Asim, which would be like the kind of stuff we hear, like when we first you know are listening to Quran and stuff like that. But like people like Ustad Jamal. Ustad Yahya, Ustad Musa Abu Zaghle, people like this, they know uh, the other qira'a. I'm not sure yeah. about many people know the other qira'a, yeah, yeah. like just someone low like me, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, but yeah, it, sure. it's amazing when you listen to, like you can go on YouTube and find a video that's like, you, you type in something like Fatiha, Surah Fatiha in all of the different yeah. uh, riwayat or qira'a. And it's like, there's some way it's like, um, Zirat al ladina like, yeah. like with a Zer. Yeah, yeah. Which, it sounds which, beautiful, actually. Of course, man. And there's some there's some t um, clips like around, like on different social media platforms, where like someone's reciting a different um, different kirat, and someone's like, in a co many people in the comments are like, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. Yeah. And like this is the first time they figure they're learning about that, which is interesting. Well, it, that also goes to show something that I mention a lot, which is the simple fact that it, like knowledge always humbles you. Yeah. There's, just, there's so many times in my life when I've said something thinking I'm so right yeah, yeah, yeah. and even thinking this is black and white yeah. and then it's like <coughs> no that's not black and white. The, the, the zirat that zirat when I was first practicing I would always think about oh if someone says the zirat al ladina that means I've said it wrong because like I know I know that's not how it is mm. but then like that's not yeah, true. Maybe they like know yeah, that Exactly, exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. So that's not true so that took me like years to even know it's a thing. Even the, you know, well, we spoke about this privately before, but like this concept that Sheikh Abu Usama Dhabi has a lot in his lectures, which is if there's a matter of fiqh, don't be rough and tough. Yeah. And if it's a matter of aqidah, obviously that's different. Yes. But then you realize, well, how many, how many things are actually a matter of fiqh that um, you are like rough and tough with someone? And when I spoke to, um, when we had Mufti Munir on the podcast, but I went, do you mind turn, if I turn the AZ off? No. Um, I, so, so an example of uh, fiqh for uh, <laughs> 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 aqidah is like what you believe, and fiqh is like the different like jurisprudence rulings. And so, an example could be something like, um, uh, uh, like if your sock has a hole in it, mm. um, can you wipe over that sock still when you make wudu, or like is it no longer classed as a sock? And there's different opinions on that. And so, the point that uh, the sheikh was making in the lectures is fiqh issues like that be soft on each other. If you believe that a sock is only a valid sock if it's a leather sock, mm. and um, the other person believes, or if it, even a, a more like, a, a, a different one would be, if you believe a sock is a sock, but it has to be like fully, no holes in it, mm. like normal Fully sock. intact, yeah. Yeah, like, but then somebody else has a hole in their sock and they believe that that's fine, um, which is what I believe, then even though you don't believe that, that's not a thing to be rough on them with because there's major scholars who yeah. have that opinion and would you be, for example, rough with those major scholars? That's like the general principle that he gives. I'm sure the more you increase in knowledge, like better than me, you probably can like have those things and like speak to people about it. But the point that I was making is that when, I, when we did the podcast with Mufti Munir, we asked him on the podcast, we said, what do you, what's like, what would you say to someone who's like, believes that they can eat the food, like, I don't know, like McDonald's or something in like, mm. um, UK. in UK or something like that. A bear, a buy, go back to the episode if you want to like give the actual question. But something like that, he said, even, if my, even though I don't follow that opinion, opinion if my own friends were if, eating a Big Mac in front of me, I wouldn't say anything. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like I'm, I'm so, um, I, I have my priorities wrong, kind of. Like, mm. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, like, to, to, to eat that, but I'm saying, like, I'm so... if I Imagine if I was soft on so many fiqh issues that I have an actual major opinion on it, not just any fiqh issue, but that's a major opinion. Imagine how many people I would have probably not closed off to the deen, that, like, maybe my family or my friends, who I would like them to come to the deen, but because of how I am, they've got the impression that the deen is so strict and they've actually been scared away from it. Yeah, yeah, man, for sure. And I, I, I you see this a lot now with, like... um. Obviously, more people like learning about Islam now, or embracing Islam, where it definitely feels like 
it's happening more publicly, people from like the Western countries in general. And a lot of them have these questions of like, oh, I can't, you know, they, they find out about a fiqh issue that's like a branch and it stops them from even like becoming Muslim or something like that. Cause they feel, oh, I can't, I don't do X, Y, and Z in my life. And so I can't text you how to, what should I do to ask a question to the community or something like that. It's like, it's a branch thing. Like it's not, it's not like a- Does uh, it take you out of the fold of Islam? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, um, it's good. To, knowledge is important, man. Not that I'm knowledgeable, but the more you learn about these things, the more you learn like what's, where there's a difference of opinion, where there isn't a difference of opinion. Because some fiqh issues, there isn't a difference of opinion on, but some, some there is. Once you know what is, what isn't, you can like, start to know where to be soft, but being soft in general is like the way forward, man. When I first was like ignited with the passion for Islam, there's this one friend that like really brought me closer to Islam for Allah. And um, uh, what he would do is, at the time I would like still, you know when you're transitioning, you're still like a mess, right? Yeah. And, but I knew in my heart, like I love Islam and I want to follow it. Yeah. And I would speak to him all the time. I'd be like, oh bro, I did this. And he'll be like, obviously, I, now I know you shouldn't expose your sins, but at the time I was like, like, he was like, like my God, I, oh, I did this. And you know what he'd always say to me, bro? If it was an issue where there was a different opinion, he'd be like, bro, don't worry, there's an opinion that that's fine. Yeah. Every time, bro, I'm like, wow, the Islam is so <coughs> soft and easy. I'm like, oh, but I did this. Bro, don't worry, there's an opinion that's fine. And then if there was a situation where there's no way for him to maneuver it, he would say, to, and I'll be like, bro, I did this, like, I feel so bad. He'd be like, bro, it's fine. Um, I, I just make Toba as soon as you make Toba it's wiped just make Toba and intend not to do it again oh my gosh so there's, all, there's always a way out of everything and what I noticed is that he would always be like oh bro don't worry that's fine that's fine that's fine because there's an opinion on that 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 and that and then he himself would hold himself to a higher bar though yeah. and he wouldn't do those things and so as much as he'd be soft on me he'd be strict on himself and I would want to be like him yeah. so he taught me through his character and by being soft and uh, honestly bro like it was life changing yeah you and me were talking offline about like this whole concept again that I talk about is like being your own best friend type of thing yeah. but like when it comes to the dean you need to like be a bit more like strict. with yourself it's yeah. like you can't like give yourself any leeway really you need to like push yourself to be better so but for other people again if there's excuses you can make make excuses keep it moving man mm. yeah okay so let's talk about the elephant in the room slash the actual main uh, mm. part of this podcast so um we by now would have just literally like just launched uh or announced that we that you and i next month are going back to our um, <laughs> our places of birth Correct Are you are you born in UK? Yeah, I'm born in London, mate Yeah, same So we're going back to London Born and bred Yeah, exactly yeah. Um, We're going back to the, the, uh, London next month Inshallah, June Inshallah. Um, And we're going to be speaking at an event For a company called Wasia mm -hmm. uh, And Well, I don't know Like, should I just hand it over to you And ask you like <laughs> Well, w the big question Like, what is Wasia? Yeah Why are we there? <clears throat> and then we can break it down. Yeah, so I think what is Wasia is a good, um, a good question to start with, right? So Wasia is essentially a way for Muslims to purchase property here in the UAE and um, inshallah in future other places as well without any interest, right? So that means um, there's payment plans in place. So you're not having to buy properties um, in total in cash from day one. There's three year payment plan, four year, ten, up to 10 years in some situations. And yet there's no interest involved in that contract. Um, even if there's um, like in other contracts, for example, there'll be late payment fees, which falls under uh, RIBA. Even that's been removed from these contracts, right? So it's kind of revolutionary. Um, it's stemming from a company, a French company run by some um, uh, amazing um, uh, brothers here called Muslim Mobilier. I hope, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Muslim Mobilier. That's the one. Yeah. Um, they... They have ha already had a lot of success with this in the French market, right? So last year, 2022, they did 30 million thousand, sorry, 30 million. 30, 30 million, million thousand billion <laughs> plus. Exactly. Per day. 30 uh, million euros. 30 million euros in that year. Or sales. Probably sold. Correct, right? So the the company- Not 30 million in clean profit. Oh, no. Yeah, 30 million. Yeah, yeah. 30 million probably sold. Um, and so they've had a lot of success in the French market, right? So specifically been targeting French speaking Muslims essentially. And now they want to go into the UK uh, and the English speaking market. And that's where inshallah you and me can come in to help them break in to that market, to uh, help that market understand the benefits 
not just obviously of avoiding riba, which the benefits of that are clear, but also the benefits of investing in property here in the UAE. Yeah, investing in Dubai. Investing in Dubai. is a booming uh, market. Absolutely. The barrier to entry, i.e. cost, is much lower here, yeah. which we can go into. Um, the payment plans again. Yeah, I'm gonna sh- I think I want to spend the episode shooting questions at you on behalf of people. Yeah. So that we can like clear out loads of the questions. So. Hit me with a question then. All right, fine. So that's, that's actually a great question. So um, uh, I'm going to speak on like before I knew about YCR and like ask those questions <coughs> on it. So first question that would come to mind is, well, I have this assumption that in order to buy property, you'd have to be like a millionaire or like at least extremely wealthy. Mm. So let's say, for example, I'm on a good salary um, in the UK uh, but I definitely I could probably spare maybe like out of my I, I put away for example in savings I, I save a, a decent amount of money maybe like a thousand pound a month or something um, and I have spare money every month I can like maybe like a, 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 a thousand fifteen hundred two grand or something like that yeah. like in our pot like the family pot but um, I'm nowhere near am I would I consider myself super wealthy um, so is this for me that's a good question and yes um, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so uh, us growing up in London, we know, especially over the last like, 10, 15, 20 years, property market in London is mad. Yeah, yeah. You, just can't, you just can't do it. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people who are like moving out of London because they just can't afford it, moving back in with their parents, um, either moving like country or just like moving up north, like places like that. That's not the case like globally. And it's definitely not the case in Dubai, right? In the UAE, there's affordable... Um, properties that have like high uh, rental yield, for example. So if you look on the WASI website, WASI.com, I don't want to tell you it's like too like promotional, but just because you're asking about like prices and stuff, some of the some of the properties we have on there are listed for like uh, studios, like 105,000 pounds give or take, right, total, right? And they're like luxury studios. It's not just a studio like you get in London, it's like you're getting access to pools and gyms and everything like that included in there, that kind of stuff, right? Um, other properties in Sharjah, which is just down the road from Dubai, um, are available for like, even lower than that, like 78, 80,000 pounds when they're available. So we're talking about a very low barrier to entry here in terms of like overall cost. And then you factor in the payment plans, right? So you only have to put down like, again, give or take, depending on the price of the property, uh, 15, 20%, right? So you can work out what that is. Upon so let's say a uh, studio flat is 120, a brand new studio flat, 120,000 pounds, 15, 20% of that is what you put down? Yes, right. And again, this, this depends on the property, but you're looking at, again, give or take 20,000 pounds. 20, let's, let's say 20,000 okay, pounds, right? Grand you put down. Boom, yeah. Done. Here it's done. Go. And then you're doing a payment plan. Okay. So that could stretch for three years, could stretch to five, 10 years, depending on the property. Similarly. Because I've, see, I've seen one of the payment plans that's uh, seven years. And so you yeah. put down 20%, and then you're paying about 1,200 pounds a month <clears> for seven years? Yes. But the, another benefit is you'll get that property, inshallah, before that seven years is up. Right, so let's say in that, in that particular property's case, I think the handover date is gonna be three years into the payment plan or four years. Yeah, it's like May 2026. Something, something like that. Yeah. So what that means is you get the keys of the property whilst you're still paying off like whatever it is, 20%, 30%, 40% of the property, right? Which means you can start renting it out from, from that day you start getting the keys and you start getting rental income as you pay it off. So when you factor that in, much lower price than in the UK, um, the fact that there's payment plans in place with no interest and the fact that a lot, in a lot of these cases you can start renting it out even before you even pay off that whatever it is, £120,000 or, or more, it's a very, very lucrative, man. Like, especially when you look back into London and see like, what's available for people, it's very, very lucrative. And there's a reason why this um, property market is booming because that barrier of entry is quite low. And now with Wasia, like coming in and removing these interest clauses in there, inshallah, making it... Um, more accessible to Muslims. It's very lucrative, man. And the reason it was like interesting to me when we first heard about it, when we start, first started speaking to um, Yassin, who is like the, one, the co-founders of Muslim Mobilier, I know from people who I know, going out and finding properties here, everything is, is, everything is like in place, but there are some clauses in the contracts where it's like, I'd rather that wasn't there, right? And he's gone and, he's gone and partnered with these developers many developers here in Dubai to essentially have a new contract where those clauses are not there anymore, right? So when he told me that, one, I knew how much work he's been putting in. Cause it's like, I tried, when people I know try to like have those discussions, it's very difficult to have them. He went and did it not just once, but like multiple times with multiple developers. And now he's got that infrastructure in place where those clauses are no longer in there. 
So, yeah, go on. I'm going to hit you with another question. Go on. My next question is the obvious, I think, which is, well, if there's, it seems like the biggest clause is like there's late payment fees. If there's no late payment fees, then what is the <coughs> punishment? Surely there has to be some kind of um, thing in place to ensure that um, payments are made on time. So what would that thing, what is that then? Yes. So um, again, this will um, perhaps vary depending on the, the developer, but I think the default um, contract that we've, that we've seen uh, and I think I think it's going to be default for everybody, but just we'll put a caveat in there in case it is, and there may be some slight differences between two months, three months. If you miss two months of payments, for example, the developer has the right to cancel your payment plan, which means that instead of having to instead of being able to pay for the property over four years, five years, ten years, um, they may they may they have the right at that point to to, to set a new term and say we want that payment plan to be pay, uh, paid, um, perhaps upon handover, right? So when the, when you get the keys, essentially, so that's. There is risk there if you're not going to be um, hitting those payment plans. Yeah, diligent about it. But again, that's uh, the contract that um, will be available. Again, I think by default, could be two months, could be three months. It's, all, it's, a, it's a two month thing, so not a one month thing. If you miss two monthly payments, that is, they, get, they get the right to do that, not necessarily they must do that. And also, I suppose, like if they if you miss payments and stuff like they have the right to like take you to court and stuff like that. Like if you, if you, you yeah, if, if, if you basically default or like just like you can't pay any of them, then at that point it becomes like a, that's a that's a court issue. Like it's like you know, okay. be out of our hands type of thing. Fine. And okay, more questions. I'm gonna just like fire these at you. Yeah. These, I like the pace at which you're answering them because they're like quick. Um, the other question I had another question which was okay, if for example. I want to buy a property, but I don't have any plans or intentions to actually move to Dubai, live in Dubai, be a mm. resident of Dubai. I'm just a guy from the <coughs> UK. I want to invest in property because I want to put it in rent. I want to have my money somewhere, which is an appreciating asset rather than just having it sitting in the bank because yeah. I don't have it collect interest. Um, can I still do that or do I have to be like a resident of Dubai and do it from Dubai and all that kind of stuff? No, no, you don't have to be a resident and you don't have to want to be a resident. As you said, it's a good place. We to do recommend. But we do. do but, but you should. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to that in a minute as well because this uh, this links to something that we're both passionate about, which is people making hijra to, to Muslim lands. Yeah. But we'll get to that in a, in a minute. But to answer your question, no, you don't have to be a resident or want to be a resident. But it's a, a place where you can invest, you can own, despite not being a resident, and you can collect rental income for, just, despite not being a resident, right? So once you get the uh, property handed over to you, you can either come over here and handle it yourself, or you can hire. Uh, either us or a different uh, property management company to hire, to rent it out for you, and then you start getting rental income. And the again, like I mentioned before, the yield, the rental yield, the ROI, is pretty good here compared to London. So here you're looking at, you know, at the low percent, like five percent net, right? So after your cost, you're looking at five percent. That's like on a low level, and then really you're looking. Most people are looking at like six, seven, sometimes even eight percent uh, return, depending on like the neighborhood and stuff like that. But that range is like considered. Dubai's range, but at below 5%, like something's gone wrong. Like that's not, Fine. yeah. Hey guys, just a quick one to say, uh, as you may have seen, we've launched Freshly Grounded's members only community. Uh, it's a paid uh, exclusive community for like-minded, high caliber Muslims, both male and female. It's completely segregated. Uh, you can access it by going to tribe.freshlygrounded.com. It's seven pounds a month and you get access to um, who's on the who's on our private Discord right now? Let's just list some people off. So you have got Super Saf, over a million subscribers on YouTube. Kamal Saleh, the um, from One Path Network. You've got um, some people who own some really big brands, like seven figure CEOs, who I can't say who, which brands they own, but you would have heard of them. So anyway, check it out if you want access uh, and be in the same community as and be and and get value from and give value uh, in the community. Go to tribe.freshlyground.com. You can sign up and apply. Uh, there's a quick uh, vetting uh, process just to make sure that you both give and can receive a great value to the community because uh, you want to keep the community nice and valuable. Uh, seven pound a month. Check it out. Freshlygrounded.com. Sorry, tribe.freshlygrounded.com. I was going to say in a minute, it'd be good to like understand what an off plan is because yeah. I feel like I didn't understand off plan what that meant. Right. Um, so actually, let's start with that. So, like, what is what does it mean? Like, does Wasia only offer off plans, and what isn't off plan? That that's helpful for my next question. Okay. So, off plan property is basically um, developers in Dubai uh, will say, you know, we're about to start constructing this residential building. Uh, construction is starting soon, and it's going to be handed over in you know what, two, three, four years, right? And I give you the, the, the estimated date. 
that's an off-plan property, which means either it hasn't started construction yet or it's, in, uh, it's being constructed, but it hasn't completed yet and it hasn't handed over yet, which means the keys, the developer haven't handed over the keys to anybody yet. So it's still in construction, whatever phase that may be. So this is a normal thing, isn't it? Because in the coming from the UK, obviously I probably, probably because there's a housing crisis, it's not like just yeah. the land available. It doesn't seem like a normal thing for that to be the case. Whereas here it's like, I speak to people all the time and like, even in my area, like I spoke to someone two weeks ago, he's like, yeah, we bought a house, we're just waiting for it to be built. So in the meantime, we're renting here. And I'm like, and I spoke to another guy, he's like, yeah, we recently bought and um, yeah. uh, waiting for that to be built. And it's like, it's such a normal thing here, yeah. but it's kind of unheard of until I moved here. So I guess, yeah, like, is that the norm? It is, because look, Dubai is a growing city, man. It's a city that's booming right now. London had its boom, if you will. Like it, they already built like, you know, you look at London, there's almost no space to build anymore. So they had that they had that boom already. They had that housing um, sort of boom, but Dubai is very much like still developing and still people are still you know coming here. It's, it's, it's an attractive place to, to come and live and work. So things are getting built. Townhouses are getting built. Apartment complexes are getting built, and that continues to happen as 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 long as Dubai continues to like be booming. You know, um, so it is normal. Um, it happens in the UK as well. Like you do find off-plan properties in the UK, okay, but just yeah. like less, less often, okay. and usually outside of London. So okay. it's not a totally alien concept to people in the UK, but here it's definitely more normal. And um, yeah, people just like they buy off-plan, they rent for a couple of years while it's been built, and they move in. Okay. Uh, next question. This is the question I wanted to ask. Let's say, for example, I want to buy off-plan. Uh, mm. I want to buy a house, right? We buy like a flat, a studio apartment, one hundred twenty yeah. grand. I put down the twenty grand deposit. I start paying for like six months or whatever. And then I either decide that actually I don't want it. Yeah. Or I say, raw, in the last six months, the value of that area in Dubai has gone up so much, I'd rather just sell it. Yeah. Do I have the ability to just sell my off plan contract even if the house isn't built? Like, is that an option that you're provided? Yes, you can you can sell it. Um I have to double check whether it's you've got to pay off 20% or 40% of the property before you can sell it on. Uh, but I, th I, won't say, I won't say either one, but it's definitely one of those two, I think. I suppose it would also be worth checking. I'm sure it's, well, I don't know. It would also be worth checking individually the Islamic permissibility of, whether, of selling a contract, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's up to you, I guess. As in, as in, like, you work, if you're going to do that, you should. Cons if you personally are going to sell all your contract, like mm. that's something that you. I yeah, I don't think about that. Do. But yeah, that's a good point. So before I say anything, but like in terms of like, can you do that physically? Yeah, you yeah, can it, sell your. It's apartment. possible to do before you can it's sell built. your plan to Bef someone else. Yeah, before it's built, before it's completed, you can do that, and people make money doing that. They they buy off plan properties with the intention to sell it before it even gets completed. Fine, yeah. I, I mean I know that because. Recently, you and I were having a discussion with one of our neighbors who bought an off plan. And I was like to him, how did you buy that? Because I heard that that thing sold out. That, that they sold out when they launched within 30 minutes, which is crazy yeah. how busy these things are, how, 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 how popular these things are. And so he had to buy it off someone else. Yeah. And so that's another thing to worth mentioning is that they're so popular that like within th someone like a developer, if it's a good developer would like be like, hey, we're launching this community of like loads of buildings and within 30 minutes of launch, like all of them are sold out, which yeah. is incredible. So Wersia gets, gets like a certain amount of units reserved to them. Yeah, so they've got partnerships in place with um, a whole bunch of developers in Dubai where they've got an allocation of their studios, apartments, townhouses, which they sell, again, through these contracts that are, inshallah, totally interest-free. Um, so yeah, there's like, there's a limited supply that, have, that, that has that contract attached to it. But um, yeah, they have a decent like amount per project. Okay. Um, what other questions did I have or do I feel like people might have as obvious questions? Um, Is there anything that you can think of that I haven't asked? Um, like obvious things that come to mind or that we were questioning at first? I think you covered most of it. I, I guess we could start talking now about like... Why you would want why, to... Why you would want to... Yeah, why, yeah and, and what, op what opportunities are open to you if you do want to move here? It's probably yeah. a good discussion. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, maybe if I, if, I, if if the question comes back, yeah, just ask. Yeah, I'll ask. I'll, I'll allow you to do that. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right, fine. So um, I've lived in Dubai a year, over just like exactly one year now. You've lived here in Longberg like three or four years. So maybe it's worth understanding. So for me, maybe it's worth me talking about like my journey with like property. Yeah. 
nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never considered uh, really buying property. Yeah. Mainly because I personally don't follow the opinion. No, sorry. I personally follow the opinion that um, I, like I wouldn't get a mortgage. I uh, And so because mortgage wasn't an option for me, I've always thought, well, my only true option where I feel completely content is to buy something outright. Mm. And so I thought, well, inshallah, that's an option for me. But it's not something that was in my, um, let's say, you know, near future. Because I was thinking to buy, for example, in where I live in West London, um, and these weren't mansions, bro, but I remember like one, like the corner house in like one of the estates became available. And I was like, oh, like you said, is it like on sales? So I was like, oh, let me check. Yeah. And on Zoo Plus, something I checked, it was like 700,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah. And so in the, at that point, I thought to myself, you know what? Like, I'm probably going to be renting for a long time. 700 grand is not something that I can afford. Inshallah, one day, if I have 700,000 pound cash, yeah, I'll buy a property. Yeah, why don't it be nice to own a property, not have any payments? and be in a situation where I have security for my family and stuff, but yeah. also I've kind of accepted the fact that I'm going to be renting. It was only when I came over to Dubai and I saw like off plans and stuff, I was like, oh, like there's an opportunity here to like, for example, for example, buy studio, like buy a studio flat uh, and then pay that off. Yeah. And then buy another studio flat, but now you've got two studio <coughs> flats that you own that are like worth 150 grand each, that's 300 grand. And then when it's time to eventually buy my forever home, and there's a forever home for like 400 grand something, I, I own two properties. I could like choose to sell them and then get all the cash out and just buy one property. So my point is I started seeing something being more realistic here, yeah. whereas I never saw in the UK that ability. I mean, I know in the UK you could do the same, like you can buy a flat. I, I, I'm sure it's not the case anymore, but I remember... Um, like years ago when I was looking you could buy a, like a flat in Leicester for like a super affordable price compared to London so I was like oh maybe I could do that maybe I could like save up rather than like 700,000 pounds up 200,000 yeah. pounds like which is more realistic than seven and eventually buy a property in Leicester and then like buy another flat here and up north and then eventually have three or four properties and then when I'm like 50 be like oh, I'm going to sell all of my portfolio and then buy yeah. a forever home however it was feeling unrealistic so mm. um when I came to the UAE, I was seeing people doing this and I was thinking, wow, like you can actually buy either a forever home or if you just want to be an investor, Airbnb is so huge here. Like even just like buying a one bed flat and putting it in Airbnb, getting someone to manage it. Like these start to seem like realistic goals, even if you're not like in that super wealthy category. Yeah. I mean, look, naturally you're going to be in the one, you'd probably be in the 1% of people in the world in terms of finances. Yeah. But uh, I was watching a video recently, like being in the top 1% means that you're earning 25 grand a year mm. if you compare it to the whole world. So most of the people listening to this are going to be in that top 1% because Allah's given you that um, like blessing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess like that was one of my things that like it, start, it starts to feel a bit more realistic, I guess. It does. And to, to your point, all right, 700,000 pounds Get you like a what, one bedroom in, in London, something like that, right? No, no, no. It was a full corner house, like oh, right. three bedroom house, like... Fine. There are definitely some apartments in London that would cost their own grand, though. Bear in mind, I live like zone five. Yeah, fine, fine, fine. Okay. So That's in, still very expensive, 100 grand. Yeah. So right now, there's a, a development called Damak Lagoons, right? And this is on Wasi's website. It's a four bedroom townhouse. And again, it's like, it's not like in a rundown area. It's like, oh, it's like a 50 year old house. It's a brand new house with like. No one's lived in it before. It's got access to like. Uh, again, swimming pools, gyms, a, a little mall, all that kind of stuff. Like all the amenities are there, and it's less than five hundred thousand pounds. It's a four-bedroom townhouse. Okay. You know, so that gives you an idea of like what we're talking about here—the the difference in pricing. Uh, and that's again the same. Like when you buy studios in London, studios here, the same sort of price disparity is there. Um, what was the other thing you mentioned? I remember Yasin saying like actually like the majority of the customers for Muslim every year. <coughs> so, so also, I think maybe this is one of my questions about like the logistics behind it because yeah. what sounds can sound scary is that, oh, there's a new company called Wasia, why would I trust it with my money? Mm. And um, so what kind of gave me contentment with that is the fact that Muslim every year have been doing this for years. They've been doing it in France and it's the exact same company. It's literally the fact that they um, launching it now for the Muslim market. So the exact same team is behind it. Um, they've been doing this for years, the same operations, the same CEO, yeah. and so on and so forth. It's called Wasia because Muslim Mobilier yeah. as a name, a French name would yeah. not work in the UK. That's right. And so um, we actually helped them come up with the name. Yeah. And the name, where does it come from actually? Let's, that's an exciting thing to share. Yeah. Um, it's the it's the ayah in the Quran. Wait, let's use Tartil. Okay, go on. 
Nice. Yeah. So nice. if you go to Tartil app, which you should download, uh, you can search that. So we basically, there's an eye in the Quran as Kaya rudely when he told you. <laughs> okay, so we can go to Tartil and we're going to go search and then we're going to just say the word Wasia. Wasia. Okay. Okay, there's actually one, two, three, four places in the Oh, really? Quran. I didn't know that. Um, I'm gonna read the I. I'm gonna read from the bit that's like uh, that has the word wasia. Yeah. So and then I'll read the translation. So in the Arabic, it says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim." In the ayah, it says, "Qalu alam takun ardullahi wasia." So that's like just part of the ayah. So that's that's where we got the name and we helped the guys come up with the name but what the ayah says it says when the angels seize the souls of those who have wronged themselves scolding them uh, saying like what do you think you were doing they, they will reply we were oppressed in the land the angels will respond was Allah's earth not spacious enough Wasia is spacious mm. for you to emigrate it is they who will have hell as their home, what an evil destination. So the point is, is that Wasi'a means like wide, which insinuates like the earth is wide. So if you want to like move home, the earth is wide, come here to this beautiful country, beautiful land, like, and obviously Wasi'a is gonna also uh, be sending homes in Turkey, Morocco, I Morocco, think. Other places in the MENA region, but for now, yeah. it's, for now it's UAE. Yeah. So anyway, Wasi'a as in yeah. earth is wide. That's right. And, like, I, and that parlays a little bit into like, the whole like this is a good opportunity for and this is what like really attracted me when Yasin was telling us about the project you and me spoke about this for ages like trying to make it more accessible for Muslims in the West to, to, to leave the West and, and move somewhere else where they can affordably live long term this is that right this is like affordable payment plans affordable property overall um, less pressure to, to make the payments now because and, and also again most importantly there's no interest in these in these contracts which is obviously the main main thing it's just very exciting from our perspective now, it hasn't really been done before as you mentioned not in the, not in the English speaking world anyway but these guys have had the, done a, a lot of good work in the French speaking world and now they're just launching it to the English speaking market that's all it really is so probably the one thing we haven't mentioned mm. the event Oh, yeah. oh, we did mention it, but we, oh, get, we? we said we we're going to be there in June. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah so we did mention it, but, we'll, but we'll, we'll, end on, we'll end on that again to like yeah. talk about that. But yeah, um, what was I saying? You were saying we were about me essentially like moving to the Muslim fine, land. exactly. So this is a this is a golden opportunity. Most people in the UK are like, okay, I can't uh, buy now. I have to rent or move back with my parents, or they're figuring out ways, or they're looking at mortgages and they're thinking, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, you know maybe it's a necessity maybe it's a necessity but honestly this now is like a very accessible way to get out of that situation right a very accessible way if you're thinking about putting that a, a down payment in uk that down payment more than covers your down payment for this and you're getting a nicer place you're getting a muslim country to live in a nicer place with better amenities nicer weather so on and so forth the benefits are just like too long to list and it's permissible inshallah so it's a golden opportunity and that's why we wanted to get involved as well to, to some capacity because we know from our past experience people we 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 speak to our family our friends they're all in that situation where they're at that age and they're struggling to find a way forward and this is a golden opportunity to move forward in, in, a, in a muslim country inshallah yeah i think there's another question that's like um a pretty mm -hmm. obvious question mm -hmm. um so where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm gonna I'm gonna while I just find that, can you just explain the event a bit because we've yes we, we're pretty much going the podcast because uh, but if you can explain when where what where who why and how to access it and all that kind of stuff for the event while I try and find this is the venue confirmed by the way. Um, the venue is like uh, as good as confirmed, but. Uh, it's, well, probably, well, it's, a, it's a central London hotel. Yeah. So we'll say it just for that because we have a large area. Yeah, because because that the, starts with the <laughs> <key>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, I yeah. think like it's better to just yeah. wait for for, for we'll talk, yeah a couple of days issues. until it's actually confirmed. But you get email at the venue, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They'll get so we have um, a link on the Instagram announcement and and, and elsewhere where you can go to the Eventbrite. Um, link and sign up and get your tickets and we will then email you the exact location. It's wasia.com forward slash London. Wasia.com forward slash London. And essentially it's, it's, a, it's a central London hotel. 
Uh, it's going to be on a Saturday, June the 17th. Myself, Faisal, uh, and our uh, and um, Yasin will be there as well uh, to explain again what WASI is, what problems it's solving. Um, the presentation that we'll be giving will again address the dangers of RIBA and then address how these payment plans are sort of revolutionizing the way you can actually access these properties. And then we'll be able to talk to you about the properties we have, the properties you're interested in, and hopefully help you make some decisions. Uh, and I am um, actually, why are we going to be there? I'm actually um, going to be delivering the initial presentation. And you Carl are. Gonna, well, I yeah. guess we both are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so that's basically the French presentation, but in... Uh, in English, hopefully. Because my, my accent ain't great. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's, what, here's the obvious <coughs> question, which I think I have to manage tentatively, but it will be an obvious question people will ask. And so I think like we have to point people in the right direction, essentially. So the question I think people will ask a lot, which is oh, was the very first question you and I asked, which was like, how can we be certain that like these contracts have been like checked over yeah. or like from an Islamic perspective? And so like I understood that the concept of uh, obviously I'm not a specialist in Islamic <coughs> finance but I understood the concept of like paying something in installments being fine generally right like for example um, the, uh, that's how I bought my car initially in the UK which is I bought it on a payment plan but not through um, not through any of the three obvious ways like I think people do lease to buy they do this other one called HS or something like that H I don't know, but yeah. HS HP or that. anyway there's always different ways but I didn't do it like that I bought it privately and I paid in installments and there was no interest there was no fluctuating price it was just a fixed price and I paid in installments yeah. the, the kind of cost of that is that I had to pay I, it was an expensive it was probably valued a bit more expensive yeah. but for the sake of making sure there was no rib art, that's how I did it. Yes. So I do understand payment plans. I've always understood payment plans, but I think with the more nitty gritty stuff of like late payment fees or whatever, you know, I'm definitely not the person, I don't understand that. And so that was our first question, wasn't it? Like, okay, if we're gonna work with you, like, ah, my ankle, bro. You get cramped. No, do you know what it is? But I've been sat on my ankle for so long, I just moved my ankle and I'm like, I was sat on the bone. All right. So then people ask a question. So we, um, so, okay, how do you, like, if you want like, get an idea of like the names of the shuyukh who have like um, checked this uh, contract and stuff like that. Yeah. They have like, um, you can go to Wasia, uh, you can go to Wasia and um, you'll be put through to like someone in the customer service and you actually like get details about it. It's basically like they're super transparent. So like, um, how, like you can, uh, like how contracts are checked. Obviously like before you actually buy the property, you yourself will obviously get the contract or whatever. Yeah. For, to buy it so obviously you can get the contract yourself but also there's like a list of shuyukh and um, that's uh, that's basically like what we did and then we were like spoke to them and we ourselves asked some of the shuyukh we know about the shuyukh and stuff like that and like all of this kind of stuff that's basically like how yeah. we did it and then we asked we got the contract checked but I don't want to say like <coughs> the element of us getting the contract checked because um what's a more um, definitive thing is like how the guys at Muslim Mobilier basically have done that process. So I would, I would say like with anything, like it's always good to ask questions, transparency and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, these guys at Muslim Mobilier will be able to like help with that. However, if you come to the event in London, like you'll be able to get those questions answered quicker and exactly, stuff anyway exactly so the best thing is if you're in london come to the event yeah for sure and also you know the brothers at worst have done their um they asked their shuyuk, as you as you mentioned we asked uh, people of knowledge who we know as well but we also encourage everybody to do the same yeah. do, go and ask um your local imam or the shuyuk you trust show them the contract that you get and make sure you know for our sake as well please make sure that it's fine and if there is any holes tell us i want to know because i want to fix those holes quickly but yeah. inshallah, you know, we've done our due diligence and inshallah there is no holes. And I know from previous uh, people trying to buy here that that, that, last, that was the last sort of issue that was in these contracts that was stopping people from buying, which is those late payment fees, which has been removed. There wasn't any other real issue that people were facing. So that, now that they're gone, then inshallah, it's all good. But yeah, get those, get that like, you can ask and um, I'm sure the guys will be happy to like, share the like list of shuyukh who like they've had this stuff checked by and um, 
so that's like a good thing to do because that's like what I would want to do and stuff like that. So yeah. you can do that. Uh, other than that, you can head to worksia.com forward slash London, <coughs> grab tickets. They're free, but obviously there's only 300 available and they've already yes. started going, getting reserved. Um, you can obviously book with your family, as many tickets you want, because a lot of people are going to make this decision with their family. And um, that's that really, isn't it? Yeah. Inshallah, we'll see 300 people there on June the 17th. Yeah. And I'm going to be dropping a presentation not in French. Yeah. Because currently the presentation is written in French. Yes. We're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. ChatGPT, translate this. Yeah, translate this in French. <laughs> in yeah. English. Uh, yeah. All right, guys. Thanks so much. See you next week, Inshallah. We've got some great episodes coming up with guests, by the way. So um, look forward to those. And I'll see you next week, Inshallah. I'm going to try and bring part of some more videos during the week, though, as well. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.